six children and 23 grandchildren. And this little boy over here is the youngest of our grandchildren. He's number 23. And, uh, of course, Caleb is my son. If you're not uh, aware of our, our relationship, Caleb is my youngest son. And we're, we're, he's my also pastors with me in Fort Collins as well. And, uh, but anyway, we're just, uh, uh, well, it's about time y'all got here. We just appreciate you showing up when, it's, when, you, get, when you just get good and ready. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, well, we'll have to. Caleb, why don't you come do worship again so Carolyn and Kenny can participate in it? <laughs> no, praise God. But we have been, as I said, we've been pastoring for a long time, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of us know how how difficult it is to escape the law. How, how difficult it is. I'm not talking about running away after a bank robbery or anything. I mean, but. <laughs> That, that sometimes is easier than escaping the other law, right? <laughs> anyway, I just want to talk a little bit about some, uh, a major reason that I believe we've had difficulty uh, escaping the law. If you'd turn, first of all, just quickly, we won't be in a couple of these passages very long, but uh, in Luke chapter 5, I just kind of want to stretch our thinker a little bit so we don't bruise your revelator as we get into this. You know, I was an athletic coach for many years as well as being a pastor, and and, uh, you know, stretching is to keep you from bruising and, and having any real damage done to the muscles as you go. And, and uh, I am just so, so honored to be here with these great men and women of God. And I just, I don't, I use that lightly. I mean, I'm, I mean, heavily. I don't, you don't use it lightly. I mean, I'm just so blessed. I can't hardly wait to just sit here and, and listen to these other fellows. Uh, you know, I've been uh, feeding on some of them. I'm the old guy in the bunch. But, you know, I've learned a long time ago that, uh, man, there is so much revelation coming forth all time, all the time. And uh, I'm not one of these guys that's prejudiced against the younger generation. Or, uh, you know, I, I sit and listen to the younger ones. I listen to my son when he preaches. Uh, I don't listen to Bertie very much, but uh, oh, no, no, I do too. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll be in my room when he's preaching. But uh, no, praise God, no. No, it really, I truly, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about this week. I'm excited about the opportunity and. And, and I'm excited about time to interact with, with, with those of you that are going to be here. Uh, it, it's a wonderful opportunity. And there's just so much revelation in each and every one of us. I've, I've, I've discovered that it's true that you know all things. Yes. I've discovered that it's true that you have an anointing that you have received from God and you need no man to teach you for you know all things. I've discovered that's true, but I know that that anointing also abides in each and every one of you and that I can listen to the voice that comes out of your heart and that I can grow and be blessed and be prospered and, and experience a, just a much fuller life of grace. Amen? Amen? So anyway, it's a blessing to be with you. Luke chapter 5, verses 36 and 37. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one, otherwise the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of it uh, taken out of the new one, does not match the old, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. And really all I want to focus on is that last line of verse 36, where Jesus said the new wine, I mean the, the, the new, does not match the old. Now I'm reading out the New King James Bible, and you may even have a, a margin of the Bible that says what it literally says. The literal says it does not agree with the old. The new does not agree with the old. See, they're disagreeable. They don't get along. They don't fit together. They won't work together. You can't plug one into the other and expect to get any good result out of it. Amen? The new does not agree with the old. I just wanted to visit that on our way so that Jesus could help us kind of stretch our thinker, as I said, so that we don't bruise our revelator as we get into these uh, next few sessions. Uh, not just mine, but I mean everybody else's. Uh, I'm, I'm just really blessed to be able to start this off because uh, I believe that I'm just going to give you just a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a stretch and then these other guys are going to come along and really work it, work the message in your life. So praise God. You know, you also probably know that over in Philippians 3.13, you don't need to turn there unless you want to, but at the, at the end of that verse, Paul says this, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And, you know, we seem to have an awful lot of problem forgetting the behind things. And, you know, when Paul said this, I don't believe he intended you and I to be trying to forget the behind things today. I think he intended for that generation to forget the behind things so that going forward from that point in time, there would, not, there would just be a continual reaching forward to those things that are ahead, never again embracing the behind things. And I like to call them behind things. That's 
sort of what they remind me of. But anyway, <clears throat> but here's the thing, you know, as I said, we, and, 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 you know, fear many times causes us to hesitate to reach forward, to reach forward to those things which are ahead. And, uh, you know, as I said, I, I believe Paul was really speaking these things. I know he was referring to, uh, speaking of himself at the moment that he spoke these things, and he was referring to what? He said that, that, that old perceived identity that he had before the gospel. He had, he had a perception of who he was prior to the gospel, and now he's uh, forgetting that. He's putting that behind him. But that was his old covenant identity according to his perception and understanding. And uh, he's having a tough time putting it behind. But now he says, I'm putting it behind. I'm reaching forward. As I said, we have a difficult... I'm hearing bells. I was, I was supposed to preach first. <laughs> Angels in heaven. But anyway, you know, our, our new covenant, you know, our new covenant experience demands separation from, of new from old. Isn't that right? If we're going to experience the new covenant in its fullness, if we're going to experience the new covenant and allow it to just, you know, it, it, it encourage our life every moment of every day, to bless our life in every aspect of our life, spirit, soul, and body, you know, every, every dimension of our life just be fully blessed the way the Father wants it blessed. We have to separate the new from the old, don't we? Yeah. Anyway, so what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about why I believe we've really struggled with separation. I know there's numerous reasons. I know there's going to, you're going to hear other things, I'm sure, uh, this week. But uh, one of the things that, as I said, we've been pastoring since 1978. My wife and I are involved a lot with people on a regular basis. You know, a lot of counseling, a lot of, a lot of uh, interaction with folks. And we just discovered that people really struggle with forgetting the behind things, even though we ought not to be even embracing any of the behind things in these days. See? People have still been uh, attached to these things. And so I, I've just asked the Lord a lot over the years, you know, why is it, Father, that we have so much difficulty uh, letting these things go? Why is there so much opposition from the legalists to the revelation of grace? Why are these people standing in opposition? Why don't they want to be free? What's going on? And the Lord has shown me something that I believe is a tremendous uh, thing. Some of you may have probably heard me teach along these lines before, but let's lay a little groundwork first. If you'd go with me over to Hebrews chapter 8. In verse 13, I'm reading, as I said, I'm reading out of the New King James Bible. <clears throat> so then, uh, and, and I want to say this too, you know, I am a strong, strong proponent of that mirror version that you're holding in your hands. Uh, we read out of it. We, uh, we occasionally give, uh, you know, I, I read it when I'm, uh, when I'm preaching at home. But I, I, the reason I preach out of the New King James Bible is because I, I really want people to be able to see that the versions that they're, most, that they're most used to have the same message that Francois has so wonderfully translated for us in the mirror version and that they can find it if they have an understanding. They can find it if they believe it. If they know it's there, you can still find the truth here. See? And then once they found the truth, then I can hand them a mirror and can say, now go enjoy it even more, you know? But, I, but again, I'm, I'm not preaching out of this Bible because I stand in. I love that word, man. My wife just reads it every day. I have to fight with her to get it from her every so often. In fact, she took mine and went to Dallas. <clears throat> so that's another reason I'm preaching out of the New King James today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Romans, or Hebrews 8.13. In that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. There's some tense issues here, so I'm going to read this out of the Amplified quickly to you because this version talks about what is becoming obsolete. The Amplified says it this way, when God speaks of a new. Now, if you're using anything other than, uh, well, of course, if you're using the mirror, you're probably not going to see this, what I'm talking about at all. But, you know, if, if you're using, um, you know, New King James one that italicizes words that aren't actually there in the manuscript, you probably notice here that the word covenant uh, is in italics. And so, you know, while it's totally appropriate, because that definitely has been what he's been talking about, I want you to kind of broaden your, uh, your, your understanding a little bit as we go here. So let's, let's do this first of all. And this is what the Amplified says. When God speaks of a new, he makes the first one obsolete. Everybody say obsolete. obsolete. I love that word. Church needs to look it up and find out what it means. When God speaks of a new, he makes, who makes, he makes, he makes the first one obsolete, out of use, and what is obsolete. You see, this new King James said what is becoming obsolete, but, but the Amplified really speaks to it the way it literally is written and, and just says once again, it is obsolete. 
Let me communicate that thought to you. It is obsolete. It's not becoming obsolete over the next 2,000 years of the church from the time he wrote this. See? He said, what is obsolete, out of use and annulled because of age, is ripe for disappearance. And listen to this. I love this. And is to be dispensed with altogether. Is to be dispensed with altogether. Now, it says, when God speaks of a new. A new what? Well, a new anything that God speaks of, right? Okay, when God speaks of a new. Now, here about a year and a half ago, I did a, just a, a, a brief series in my, in my church on what I called it, what's new. And what I did was I took the 13 things that are described as new in the New Testament scriptures. I'm going to read them to you real quick. And, and I want you to understand that we're going to plug this in. I'm not going to go over them all individually and plug them into this verse. But you plug them into this verse. <clears throat> Here's the things that are, that are new by, by definition. Creation, life, spirit, man. Garment, wineskin, wine, tomb. That was really a, a good revelation there. That's an interesting. Tomb, lump. I mean, you like that one. You're a new lump. Is that good? I hesitate to say that to most women. But anyway, old things that were intentionally, remember that word, there is a lingering influence of old things that were intentionally written into the New Covenant Scriptures. They were intentionally written in there, right? But these things which were intentionally included have unintentionally produced confusion and a polarizing effect in the, in the, in the uh, later generations of the church. Now, we're going to talk about what, what those things are in just a second, but I want you to get on. I say a polarizing effect. You know, there's been confusion. You, un, you all understand that. But they've also produced a polarizing effect. And what does that mean? That means that we find, we find ourselves at opposite ends from one another. You know, Bertie and I have been talking about how people can say things in a different way with the same idea in their heart, the same understanding in their heart, and the next thing you know, you read on Facebook, you've been defriended by them, unfriended. And, and they were part of the grace nation or the uh, whatever. They're part of the grace. That's what they identify themselves, and yet they're polarized, you see. And so uh, we were, Bertie and I were talking when he was up at my church last year, and and we were talking about a specific individual. It didn't make any difference because it would apply to most of us, actually. And he just said to me, he said, she also preaches grace. Not meaning she preaches grace along with us. She meant she also preaches grace. In other words, that's part of her message. But it, it in all grace, see. And, and I like that. I hung on to that. It's, one of the, it's the only thing of Bertie's that I repeat, I think. I can't remember. The, I, I think there are some other things. I have a tough time understanding him. He's just <laughs> probably because you're way beyond me, brother. Huh? What? <laughs> oh. Anyway. <laughs> but anyway, as I said, you know, these things were intentionally added, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, why they were intentionally added. But they were intentionally included, but they have unintentionally produced confusion and polarization. And so consequently, you know, we begin our discovery of, of, for, of gospel revelation at a disadvantage if we don't discern the, the purpose, if we don't discern the purpose for these old things in new settings. That makes sense to you? And see, so what, here's what's happened. We have. We, we, there, was, there, there, was, there was a, well, let, let me just go on because I, I'll just confuse me and you. And once I get confused, we're out of here. <clears throat> But these things, had a, these things had a temporary purpose for the first generation of the church, the things that we're going to talk about. They had a temporary purpose, and they were never, they were never to extend beyond the first generation of the church. And sadly, what's happened, these, these things that uh, were, were to disappear have actually uh, seen a re great revival of doctrine, and they now are the, uh, the doctrines that polarize us in the body of Christ. You know what I'm saying? So why the intentional inclusion of old things in the letters to the churches? Now, here's what you've got to get. This is why you say, first of all, you say, well, why in the world, you know, would you come up here and tell me that, that, that the old and the new do not agree? Why would you tell me that we need to, you know, to forget the behind things and, and reach forward to the things that are ahead and then turn around and tell me that, that the Holy Spirit purposely included some old things in some new settings? Okay? Why would you tell me that? What's the reason for the inclusion of old things in new settings? Well, here's what you need to understand. The first generation of the church was a special needs generation. I don't mean that in the way we use it today. 
Not, I didn't say special education classes. I said they were special needs generation. And I call it the transitional generation because this is a generation that the majority of the people at the writing of the epistles were people who had lived on the old covenant side of the cross and now they live on the new covenant side of the tomb, right? So they're a transitional generation. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but all of the Hebrew, I mean all of the Hebrews, all of the letters, all of the, the letters of the New Testament here have specific postal addresses. Yeah. Rome, Corinth, you know. I haven't found a one that says to the church of 2013, <laughs> right? Now, I'm not excluding the revelation of truth as an ongoing, but, but, in, but I can tell you that in the minds of the writers, now I'm sure God knew, obviously God knew, but, but the point is that in the minds of the writers, I can guarantee you that none of these fellows thought their letters would be, written, be being, being read today. Of course, most of them didn't think the world would go on this long, probably. But, but the point is, you see, they didn't have any idea that, that the church at West Monroe, Louisiana, would be read, you know, reading the scriptures, reading their letter. Only one place, now some of you guys that know more than me might be able to correct me on this, but... Uh, I can only think of one place, I think it's uh, Colossians 4.16, where Paul even tells a particular church to make sure that another church reads his letter. He said, make sure that the church at Laodicea reads this letter and make sure you read their letter. But I can't discover that anyplace else. I can't find it that, that Rome knew what any, anything about what, what Paul wrote to Corinth or that Corinth knew anything about what Paul wrote to Ephesus. Now, it could very well have been, but you see, in this world where everybody's sitting here now, right now, with your little uh, electronic gadgets, you know, and, and something happens in Singapore, and we know about it almost as ha fast as it happens, you know, we don't stop and think sometimes that this collection of scriptures that we call our Bible right here were, 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 uh, were not really written to us. See? It wasn't the expectation of the writers, See, it was the work of the Holy Spirit, I believe, that kept things together so that we could get the truth and the revelation of it. I'm not saying that at all. I, I'm not throwing my Bible out the window. Don't take me wrong on this. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. But we, we need to realize we're dealing with this first generation of the church. They are a transitional generation. As these men, for the most part, are writing their letters, they're dealing with elderly people, adult people, not, 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 not infants, you know, when, when Paul stood up and preached, if, if there were infants in the crowd that had been born this side of the, this side of the uh, resurrection, then, then I'm, I'm sure that there was some benefit to them in that. But he was speaking to those people who needed to understand who they had been, who understood who they had been, I mean, and who now needed to understand who they were because of the Jesus in between. Does that make sense to you? So this is a transitional generation. They're a special needs generation. There was information contained in the epistles to help these people understand how Jesus had brought them across the bridge from Old Covenant to New Covenant. How Jesus had made of them, you know, something entirely different than what they were familiar with. Because whether they were Jew or Gentile, they still had, they still had lived in Old Covenant times. They still had lived with an Adamic nature. They still had lived branded by sin and death, whether they knew it or not, the Gentiles. Okay? <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate that. Praise God. So the, the information that was contained in these epistles, and you're going to see this more and more. And I'm only going to just give you a brief picture. I mean, I did a whole bunch on this before, and, and, and it's in a lot of my series in different forms over here because it's so important that we get this. But the information that was contained in these, in these transitional writings, that's what I call them, tr the transitional writings of the tra to the transitional generation. And the information was, was, was information that was to help these people, you know, through, the, uh, through change theology to understand what's, what's taken place. And there, that's part of the reason that I started with the book of Hebrews here, just using that, because where is it more obvious, you know, than the book of Hebrews? See, and, and so we, we've seen at least three, and I think there's a couple of others. We've seen at least three places where he's emphasizing to the Hebrews, off with the old and on with the new, right? Because these people really did have, you know, a background that, that revealed to them an identity of sin and death. Didn't they? And now what he's wanting to reveal to them is an identity of life, an identity, a totally new identity. See, So these people, uh, above maybe more, what I want to say, more recognizable than anybody else, but the truth of the matter was it was still the same thing. So, so in other words, you were here, this is what you, who you were, this is who you are now, right? <clears throat> All right, so in effect, Hebrews 8.13 that we read a while ago 
really what it tells us is, and you might, you might want to get this now, in effect what Hebrews 8.13 tells us is that the first generation of the church was the last gener- going to be the last generation of the church to ever experience any old doctrine. To ever, you hear what I'm saying? This first generation of the church is going to be the last one, you know, to ever be exposed to anything old. Remember, it was to be dispensed with altogether. You know, when, when was that? When the writer of Hebrews wrote that, let me read it out of the Amplified again here, okay? I like that. When God speaks of a new, he makes the first one obsolete, out of use. And what is obsolete? When he said what is obsolete, he was speaking of then, right? Not now. He isn't making it obsolete now. He made it obsolete then, didn't he? He made it obsolete in Christ. In his resurrection, in his death and resurrection, he made it obsolete. So that was then, not now. So we're trying to do some catch-up right now. We're trying, to, we're trying to, you know, catch up. That's exactly what we're doing. Because we've just fallen so, so far by embracing the behind things for so long. That didn't sound good either, embracing your behind. But anyway. Now, you know, John, turn with me over to 1 John chapter 2. John also spoke to this transitional moment in church history. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. It, it is true, okay, it is true in him and it's in you, okay, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. All right? So here's what he's saying. In other words, that which was already true in them, because it was true in him and they were in him, right? Okay. was beginning to dawn on them. It was beginning to become their revelation. It was renewing their understanding. It was already true, but it was beginning to become their understanding. And what was happening here was the darkness of their previous identity association with sin and death was beginning to fade away, pass away. And so he says here, the darkness is passing away. It's in the process of passing away. And the true light is already shining. Or I, on Sunday, I'm going to be talking about reality, which is the definition of the word truth. Okay, I'm going to be talking a little bit about reality, recovering reality and so on. But anyway, he's, he's saying that you know the darkness is passing away and the reality is, is already shining. True light is already shining, right? So, in other words, here's the thing, though. I want, to get you, want you to get out of this. We were never intended to relate to their past. Were we? we were never intended to relate to their past, and yet, in the ongoing generations of the church, there's been such a revival of, of the old things, such a revival and such a, a, a confusing use of transitional writings that we now relate to their past and it had nothing whatsoever to do with us. You know what I'm saying? So their, their behind things are compromising our grace experience today still. It never should have been that way, should it? All right, what I'm going to do here is just take a few minutes to, I want to look at a few of the, give you a few examples of, of these, uh, what I call them intentional transitional writings that have continued in our doctrines. And I'm just going to give you a few, and I, but I'm going to tell you something. If you can learn to read your Bible, <laughs> read your New Testament, with the understanding with th- that, there, that it is full of transitional communication. And if you can begin to do that, you're going to see some things that you've never, ever seen before. You're going to see some. Now, what's going to happen is you're not going to lose the truth. What you're going to do is lose the mixture. The behind things are going to fall off and the truth will continue to be exalted. The truth will become so much bigger in your life. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, I, Sunday I'm going to be talking a little bit, you know, I, I've kind of revamped, uh, which is, I figured if, if Francois could revamp Scripture, so could I. So I kind of revamped Romans 8 too, a couple of weeks ago. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I've just kind of revamped it in my own understanding for the understanding of others. That for the law of the effortless experience of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of effort and futility. 
Right? Isn't that good? And I like it this way too. For the law, see, of the effortless experience in Christ Jesus has made me exempt from moral, ceremonial, and mortal liability because that's what freedom means. Every time you look up that word free, the root of that word always means freedom, liberty, the perfect law of liberty. Every time Jesus said, whom the Son has made free is free indeed. When Jesus said, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Every time that word means exemption from moral, ceremonial, and mortal liability or obligation, right? I know when you throw that moral in there, it just makes the legalists terrifies them. It terrifies them. The only way I'm obligated, only way I'm obligated to morality is to Miss Marilyn. I'm telling you what, I better be obligated to morality with that woman. <laughs> no, you see, we, we've, we've got this whole, well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. If, if just come back Monday, Sunday night if you're not worn out, if you're not so over-expanded by these other guys <laughs> that your revelators are all just, ugh. I got to get away and process. Anyway, let's do some of this for a few minutes. Go, go with me to Romans six six. I want to, if, if you can get the idea and go on with this, I mean, you'll see yourself. I can, I can hardly read through a, a chapter of, of the, especially in Romans, but a, a chapter of the epistles without seeing all manner of transitional insertions that were not intended to be passed down to the very next generation of the church. Look at Romans 6, 6, for instance. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Now, we've got to go back to this. Now, so how many times was Jesus crucified? Once, when, then, right? Okay. How many times was Jesus resurrected? Once, when, then, okay? So here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, knowing this, that their old man was crucified Say, now listen to me. You never had an old man. Do you know that? You never had an old man. Jesus was the last Adam. When he died, the last of Adam died. There was no more Adam left, right? And, and And the old man was Adam. Now, see, we have this doctrine now that says, you know, before you got saved, you were an old man. And now that you're saved, you're, you're the new man. So is old Mike, new Mike? No. You know what I'm saying? And so Paul's saying this. This is transitional communication. He's saying this to that generation, not to you. Knowing this, that their old man was crucified with him, that the body of, my, of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now, hear me carefully. You never were a slave of sin. Because you were born after Jesus became a slave of sin in your behalf. See? One died for all, all died. Isn't that right? If you judge thusly, as Paul said, then you can comprehend this. If you don't judge that way, then you won't be able to comprehend this. See? Okay? You never had an old man. And this is a huge doctrine in the church. The old man, new man thing. Isn't that right? All right? Go with me over to just over to chapter seven for a minute. Again, all I'm trying to do is throw some things out here to get you get you thinking. <clears throat> In chapter seven, verse four, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. No, you haven't. They had, because you never were alive to the law. You never were alive. Now I know there's been some preachers that have tried to revive it, but that doesn't make it real. That's not reality. See. Therefore, my brethren, (laughs) they became dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. And you know, in the literal, that word married doesn't occur there. The literal says this, that you may become another, him who was raised from the dead. That you may become another. So he told them that they had died to the law through the body of Christ, so that they could become another, him who was raised from the dead. Right? Now, you came along just in time to just become him who was raised from the dead. See, there are only two identities in Scripture. (laughs) There are only two identities in Scripture, Adam and Christ. That's the only two identities of any concern to God. Now, you have your own unique personality, your own unique place of relationship with the Father. I'm not trying to take that away from you in any way, shape, or form. You know, I, I know that I'm special. I know you're special. 
you know, I've got a bumper sticker on my truck that Caleb put on there that said, you know, God loves you, but I'm his favorite. That's kind of the way I think. Sometimes I act like that and people don't like it. But anyway, look at verse 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. You haven't been delivered from the law. You were never under the law. Now, again, some of us need to have our, you know, our mind renewed to this truth. We need to be reminded of this, and that's what I'm trying to do a little bit, just to get you going here. See? All right. Now, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. This is one that, you know, I remember when I first got involved in the Baptist church after I came home from Vietnam back in the 60s or 70s, whenever it was. But um, this is, the, this is you know, how they kind of approached me. And if you'd have known me then, you'd have thought I needed to approach in with this. Well, verse 20 says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. He didn't say, if you've heard your pastor, or if you've heard somebody else and been taught by them. He said, if indeed you've heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Or in other words, the truth is who you are in Jesus, right? Okay. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man. Now, you can make this sound like a command, or you can understand this to be a statement of fact. He's not saying, you put off the old man. You put, he's saying here, If you were taught by Jesus, this is what you learned. You learned, because the truth is in Jesus. You learned, you get up here to what it was. The truth is in Jesus that you put off. See? In other words, that you have already put off. This is not a future, a command to do it, to take a future step. This was a, this was a statement to them that they have put off. And he goes on and tells them there to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Quit thinking the old way. Start thinking. Understand the truth that's in Jesus. In Jesus, you put off the old man. And you, yeah, and put on the new man, right? Which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow. Colossians is a little clearer, chapter 3. He goes ahead and says just what I just said here. And it's not because this church was in better shape than the Ephesian church that he was able to say some better things to them. I can prove it because he starts right off in verse 9 and says, Do not lie to one another. So they weren't in any better shape than the Ephesian church. It wasn't. This was the holy church. He could tell them, you, you have put off the old man with his deeds. Yeah. See, he's saying the same thing to the Colossian church that he said to the Ephesian church. But there was some, you know, we've been confused by the, you know, the Baptist did not take me over here to Colossians chapter 3. That was going to be something that I was going to aspire to. To, to where they could finally take me and say, look, you have put off the old man. Pat, pat, pat. But I used to put him back on again because I was not renewed in the spirit of my mind. I'm talking about I put him on mentally. I put him on the way the church was convincing me to put him back on, you know. All right. So here it says, you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge. Same thing. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He said this renewal is going to become real to you in knowledge, isn't it? I tell our people all the time, it, it, it's more about the knowing than it is about the believing. Yeah. Yeah. It's more about the knowing than it is about the believing. Paul keeps saying knowing this and knowing that. Now, every time I read knowing this and knowing that, I find, well, the church doesn't know this or know that. <laughs> right? He said that knowing this, that our old man was crucified. Most of the church doesn't know that. Most of the church thinks Adam survived the cross. Don't they? See, when I first saw this, when the Lord first started dealing with me about this, you know, it just changed my life. Yeah, amen, brother. (laughs) See, for this transitional generation, these old things really provided a necessary distinction between who they had been and who they now were. And so these things needed to be here. You have put off the old man. Quit thinking like that now. Don't be thinking like you thought prior to the resurrection of Christ. But you're still thinking that way. Don't think that way anymore. See? You've put off the old man. You've put on the new man. And you go down down here, and, and of course it says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. And from Ephesians we can add male or female. And then it said, but Christ is all and in all. And so I just take out all that neither nor yea and nay stuff there, and I just put it, say it this way. You have put on the new man, first words of verse 11, where there is but Christ. 
Just take that little statement. You put on the new man where there is but Christ. In other words, there's no Adam anywhere. Now, you see, I've been in this thing long enough. Like I said, I've been doing this a long time. I'm 67 years old, and I've been around the gospel a long time, and I was raised in a fairly good, you know, for the revelation that was available of that day, I was raised in a grace home. My parents didn't have the revelation of grace that we have today. We don't have the revelation of grace that our children and grandchildren are going to have, but, but, we're, but we're aspiring to a greater revelation. And, and in order to do that, we have to just successfully release the, the behind things and not consider them no more, all right? But, but we need to realize that <clears throat> I, I don't even, even know where the heck I was going with that. I stayed up too late. I was going to say something really profound. Thank you, brother. Thank, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Maybe I'll listen to more of your teaching now. Anyway, as I said, these things, you know, provided a necessary distinction for these folks. Okay. And they proved to be, if you think about it, a persuasive argument of the finished work of Jesus that had brought them across the bridge. Right? But when these things were allowed to be revived in future generations, they actually became a denial of the finished work of Jesus. They went from being a persuasive argument in behalf of the finished work of Jesus that had taken them from being an old man to being a new man. And nowadays, that same argument is that Jesus didn't finish the work because you've got to put on the new man. See what I'm saying? You've got to put off the old man and put on the new. So when these transitional writings became modern doctrine after that first generation of the church, as they began to permeate the, the thoughts of people again, all of a sudden people are living in denial of the finished work of Jesus. I don't know if you got anything out of that, but I sure did. But, Amen. See, so as I said, you know, uh, the, the best, for instance, is if Adam, who's the old man, is, is brought beyond the tomb to any degree. Think about this. If Adam is brought beyond the tomb, you know, the idea is, you know, that, that you know, I, I've had a couple of, I know I was going to say a while ago, I've had a couple of experiences with different groups uh, where when I, when, I first, when I first came back from Vietnam and I went, went to this, started getting involved in this Baptist church there in the town where we live, you know, any time I did what was right, that was the new man. See, that was my Christ nature. And then on Friday nights when I went down to the club and got drunker than a skunk, which I did, just prior to going back to church and being a new man on Sunday, I'd go down on Friday night, become the old man again. <laughs> I, 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 did, I, did, I would indulge the Adamic nature, you know, sleep it off on Saturday so that my Christ nature could be all glowy on Sunday morning at church. You know, right? <laughs> I'm not proud of it, but I did it. I did enjoy it, too. They always say, you don't enjoy sin. I did, too. We got a man in our church that said, he's a good man. He said this. He said, when I first read over there in Hebrews, he told Caleb and I this. He's our electrician. He said, when I first read over there in Hebrews that, that, that sin is pleasurable for a season, he said, I took that as a recommendation, not as a warning. <laughs> you, you can preach against that later, Bertie. That's okay. But... <laughs> But as I say, you know, if, you know and, then, and then I was told, and then, you know, now, nowadays the, the thing is that you have the Adamic nature until you confess Christ, and then you get the Christ nature. Today the, today the declaration is this. We live in a fallen world. Listen to me. That's Antichrist. We do not live in a fallen world. We live in a redeemed world where the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed us not one-third. You're not one-third wall-to-wall Holy Ghost. You are three-thirds redeemed. And if you knew it, you'd begin to live like it, act like it, and experience it. You would. You would, see? And so we live in a world that is redeemed but lives fallen because we've never told them the truth. Instead, we've revived old doctrines and carried them around and beat the world to death with them, see? But listen, think about the thing. You know, I sat in a, in a, in a well-known minister's conference here just a couple years ago, and I heard one of his keynote speakers, and of course this, this minister friend of mine said the same thing many times. He stood in the pulpit and in, and in two short sentences said, we live in a fallen world, you, you're born in sin, and, uh, and man has an Adamic nature until he accepts Jesus Christ. And boy, the Holy Ghost went off in me and said, that is Antichrist in every statement. I have redeemed this world. See? And Psalm 51 or wherever it is, conceived in iniquity, born in sin, has no application to any man, woman, or child on the face of this earth since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are born in... There, there is only ignorance and knowing. There is only ignorance and knowing now. 
We either know or we're ignorant. Jesus did not say anything other than you shall know the truth. And the, so that means there's only deception and truth. That's right. But what we've done is we have treated Adam as though he waited until he saw Jesus walking through the garden. He snuck out of the tomb. And went out there and got active again in the world. He died. Adam died. He was left dead. And if he had escaped, even in the smallest degree, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, we'd all be lost in sin again, everybody. See, so here's the thing. If Adam, I'm going to wrap up with this. If Adam escaped the, the, the tomb in any, to any degree, then either redemption has to be repeated over and over and over again because everybody fell back under sin again, if that's the truth. See what I'm saying? Or, now listen, this is, the, this is the thing that the Lord brought me to with what I said earlier. I kept saying, why do we keep going back into this? So either redemption has to be repeated over and over and over again, or <laughs> it requires your finishing touches. Right? Get anything out of that? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.